are set up. There we go. Good morning, Facebook. It's a wonderful day. And it is a wonderful day to worship them. <coughs> Good morning, Bill. Good morning, Donna. Good morning, Pearl. If you're watching on Facebook, you might notice the stage is a little different. They worked yesterday or the day before and set that up for the All Generations uh, Ladies Tea, which was held yesterday here at the church, and it was wonderful. We had a wonderful speaker, and we had wonderful uh, music and just some great fellowship. So they're going to make that annual, so watch for that ladies next year uh, close to Mother's Day the all generational um, ladies tea Good morning, Kim. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Let's all stand up and worship God this morning. We're singing a good old song with some ring here. Um, if you recognize the same album.
Who's looking forward to that day when Jesus come back again? Amen. Good morning. Uh, so good to see y'all this morning. Glad you came with us or came to join us. And for those on Facebook, glad you joined us on here too. Um, looking for a wonderful day. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's go to the word of God in prayer and then we'll uh, continue worshiping. Father, we're just so thankful and so blessed that we have a place that we can come and worship and that we have the freedom to come and worship. And Father, even more so that we have a reason to come and worship. A reason that you gave us on that cross. A reason to rejoice. Father, we just thank you so much. And Father, we just pray that as we gather here this morning and, and, and worship you and lift your name on high and listen to your word preach, Father, I just pray that you just pour out blessings on us. Father, that we can walk out of these doors saying it's truly been good to be in the house of God, but more so to be able to walk out into your mission field, into our daily lives, our jobs, our homes, or wherever we might be, and, and that your light would just shine through us so that other people can see your love. We just thank you and praise you in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
the bright and morning star would choose to light the way from my ever wandering mind. Not because of who I am, but because of what you've done. Not because of what you've done, but because of who you are. Hey 
and my wife and I usually sit in the back corner back right there because we make a better door than a window. <laughs> <laughs> she's working today, which I'm thankful for that. Uh, she's a nurse, Franciscan in Wardville. So she has to work occasionally on Sundays. So I tell you that, so I can tell you this. A few days ago, Kevin sends me a text wanting to know if I can do communion. And I said, yes. Does that get your mind working? And you can look. I've done communion before, and sometimes you just pick up your Bible and you open it up to a random spot, and there it is. That's what you're going to say. Sometimes it's a sign you might see around town in another church. And some things, and sometimes it's something that's a current event. So this week, like I said, I'm glad she's not here because after I read you this quote, you would all look back there to her and she'd be shaking her head yes. <laughs> because I'm as guilty as this of anybody. And sometimes more. The biggest communication problem is we do not listen to understand, we listen to reply. Mm. Amen. So, you need to keep that secret. Don't let her know that I admitted that. <laughs> because then that blows my theory up that I'm always right. <laughs> but if you look at recent events, I think this really goes into it. On Friday, when the Supreme Court kicked Roe back to the states, and protests and opinions and noise and chatter was flying everywhere, there's a whole lot of talking, probably a whole lot, a lot of listening, or trying to understand the other side. So the biggest communication problem is we do not, we do not listen, we listen to reply. So I guess my only request would be, as that becomes a topic, that you seek what the Lord has to say about it, and that you try to truly understand what he has to say about that topic. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your precious gift, Jesus, that uh, laid it all on the line for us, even though we are undeserving. We ask that you bless these emblems and the ones that partake in them. Amen. Amen. Amen.
let it keep going until it's done. Oh. Real close. Hang on there. Oh. There it is. Oh, impressive. Right. for us to share a little bit and continue the uh, the message of VBS and the joy of VBS because it matches our goal to share Jesus Christ uh, to you because he's the only one who can do for us what we can't do for ourselves, which is have our sins forgiven by what he did at Calvary. Amen? Amen. Amen. Kids, go ahead and go to your teaching unless you want to hear the message on Jesus is coming back to be ready. Uh, Teenagers, I think there's teaching for you as well. Hope you have your Bible. I was welcomed at the door with just my sermon in hand, and somebody said to me, where's your Bible? And I said, it's in the pulpit. And then I came in here, and the pulpit had been moved. You know, we had, we had BBS and more, so I had to gather my pulpit. I had to go get my Bible, and now I'm ready to go. Are you ready to go today? Amen. Would you turn to First and Second Thessalonians? Uh, especially 2 Thessalonians. We're going to look at chapter 3. This is the last sermon, eight uh, chapters, eight sermons. And we're going to hear the last instruction that uh, Paul gave the church at Thessalonica. And it's so practical for you and me today. Repeatedly in both letters, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Paul taught the church, Jesus is coming back. Be ready. And though that was spoken and written in this letter approximately 51, 2, 3, 4 AD, <coughs> about 20 years after Jesus ascended and, and after the resurrection, and though almost 2,000 years have passed since this writing, I must tell you who follow Jesus the same thing. Be ready. Jesus is coming back. Don't ever think Jesus isn't coming again. Otherwise, you might be like the young lady who was expecting her date. She was dressed up. She was waiting patiently. However, by the time it was an hour late, she figured that she had been stood up. So she got up, she took off her makeup, she put on her pajamas, she gathered all the junk food she could, she sat down in front of the TV with her dog, and she began to enjoy the rest of the night. Her favorite show was on TV. And then the doorbell rang. She went to the door, she stared, she couldn't believe. It was her date, the boyfriend, and he said to her, I know I'm two hours late, and you're still not ready. <laughs> Don't think Jesus isn't coming back. Don't think he's going to stand you, the church, up. Folks, he's coming again. We've got to be ready. And so Paul is about to send the last of two letters to this church to challenge them. What do you do? Why you're waiting for Jesus to come back. And it's practical instruction for that church. It's practical instruction for you and I. And the first instruction is so simple. He is telling the church you've got to get back to prayer. You've got to pray about everything. And if you remember in the chapter 5 of the first letter. The shortest verse in the Bible. Or second shortest verse in the Bible. 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, pray continually. And that's how he ended the fifth chapter of the first letter. Now he's telling the church again in the second letter, what is in chapter 3, verses 1 and following. You need to get back to prayer. Get back to pray. Look at what he said in verses 1 through 5. Finally, brothers, it's on the screen, but if not, look in your Bible. Look in your Bible. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may be spread rapidly and honored like it was in VBS. After doing, you could hear today. Just as it was with you. 
and pray that we may be delivered from the wicked and evil men for not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful while you're waiting. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. And we have confidence in the Lord that you are doing this and will continue to do the things we taught you, we've commanded. And may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Paul was asking for prayer. Do you get the idea as he's finishing these words to his beloved church that he sees a great value in praying for one another? And I believe we do that here. We, we, we've got to continue. We've got to always be a church that prays for one another. We, we do that a lot. But I, at the outset here, just want to make a confession. I'm not very good about asking the church to pray for me. Some of you know who attend Wednesday and Thursdays all year that I've mentioned from time to time that I've got a headache. I've had a headache for six months. And I would just tell that in casual conversation. And the symptoms aren't that bad, they're just annoying. I had my dad die in September, had COVID on Tuesday, missed my dad's funeral. I just thought, oh, it's just the stress coming together and COVID made it worse. Then I made a visit in January to my daughter and son-in-law and granddaughter, and I was enjoying a Friday night, getting ready to go to their house from the hotel we were staying at, and I got a river in, and it gave me a quick, quick lash. And the car was damaged pretty good, but I, I didn't feel bad. I didn't go to the hospital. I thought, oh, I'll be okay. And so I went home, but then the next week, I just started feeling crummy. And I thought, oh, it's either the stress, it's the COVID, you know, long-term, or it's the whiplash. I was diagnosed with a concussion. And I didn't tell too many people about that. I just thought, oh, I'll get over that. I'm, I, I've been a pretty healthy person 64 years, but this 65th year, you know, this has come on me. And, and so I, I've had a kind of constant annoying pain. It's not, it, it's hard to describe. And, and so I've muscled through from January to Easter Sunday. We, we preached from Romans chapter 16, 16 weeks. I can do it. I, I can make it to there. And then we had a great day on Easter. And I said to myself, you know, I'm going to just kind of take the Sunday off. I'm going to let Dwayne Lee Brent preach. And when he did, and I didn't have the duties of the week, I felt worse with less to do than I did when I was busy and, you know, just counting on tomorrow being better. And so Dwayne preached, did a good job, and then I don't know if you remember that day, I, I felt I needed to make a confession to you that I wasn't feeling good. And I think I said something like this. I probably should have told you months before that I had this problem and asked for your prayer. And I didn't do it till that Sunday. I mean, I had an outpouring of people come up to me and tell me, well, I've had something similar to that. And that was very encouraging. And here's some of the things I did to overcome that. And that was very encouraging. But what was most encouraging, after the building got kind of empty, I was in the foyer. Two ladies that are new members to the church, they had gone out to their car, and they came back in. And they, they said, we, we don't know you that well, and we're new around here, but can we pray for you? And I said, yeah, sure. I need prayer. <laughs> and you know, those two ladies put their hands on me. And they prayed for me out in the foyer. And I mean, I felt good that somebody was praying for me. Amen. Amen. Now let me just tell you, I still have the headaches, but it's not seven days a week. It's about four days a week. Uh, today, this morning, I woke up pretty good. I read my sermon again and again. And uh, then I got a piercing in my head. 
I document this now so I can tell my neurologist. And uh, then it was gone in 15 minutes. And that's been what I've dealt with. And the neurologist says, well, I can't probably solve this, but we'll look at it in a three month window. And I said, yeah, I'll be praying for it. And so I do need your prayers. I do need your prayers. And, and the headache that I have here, I want you to be sure it's not caused in the house by Leanne. <laughs> <laughs> she is what helps me solve my headaches. No, here's the second confession. I probably didn't ask for prayers because I've been so healthy 64 years. I didn't want to reveal a weakness Amen. that I was hurting. Amen. I, I'm just telling you the truth. And every wise preacher, so you see I was unwise, probably should know that asking for prayer is not a sign of weakness. It is a mark of dependence on God. Amen. Don't we all need to admit We've got something going on. We need God's help. Yes. That's why I think Paul closed this. Uh, this may be the last contact I've had with you for a long time. I want you to pray for us. Pray for me. Pray for Silas. Pray for uh, Timothy. Pray for the leadership team. Pray for us because we're going to continue what we tried to do to completion in Thessalonica. And so the next points I want you to see in getting back to prayer. He, he says here, pray specifically for this. Pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. He was only there three weekends and a thriving church happens there but, but they need to be ready for the Lord to come again and you need to pray for one another and you need to get back to work. Paul's asking the church to pray for the opportunity that is before us. And, and, and uh, BBS was an opportunity before us. This morning is an opportunity before us. I get a text every Sunday from Rick Finney. Rick's not in here today. He's with his family, and they're doing something good. And he always texts something and says something like, praying for you, Grandpa. Uh -huh. And I love that. I love that role. What would we do without connecting to the power? You saw the scenes of DBS. We had about 75 children each morning. Not to mention at night we had 20 and 20 round numbers in middle school and high school. So over 100 youth every day being taught about Jesus through the ministry of DBS. And you may recall that on the Sunday before the first day of DBS, that started at 9 a.m. We sent our little text to all the staff. Would you come early to the first day of PBS and we'll pray at 8.30 and then we'll get ready and be ready when kids start coming in shortly thereafter. And so there was probably, I would say, 25 youth and adults who gathered right here in front of the entry area of the worship area. And we, we said, hey, we have a job to do. we got to teach kids. They need to know about Jesus. And we just need to work together. And we had a little prayer. I'm not sure who said it. And then we went after it. And I was intrigued that that first day, which is pretty hectic, that it was pretty peaceful. And everybody who had never done the jobs they were assigned before got through the schedule. Everybody doing what they did with 70 kids who mostly had never been here before. And I thought, man, when they went out, I heard one adult say, you know, I think that was one of the calmest days of BBS we've ever had mm -hmm. on the first day. And I have to agree. But my thought is, would it have been as calm if we didn't ask the Lord to bring his peace and to help us spread the word to those kids. You heard a song. That's the kind of songs they learn. And they were learning every day about Jesus in the missions, in the classrooms, in the crafts. They prayed before their snacks. 
aren't those pictures of kids praying in, in the uh, cafe area just precious? Yes. We, we, we were teaching them the littlest thing to talk to God. And you know, if Christ is indeed the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through Him, people, young and old, need to hear that. And we need to make that a priority of our mission, but we need to create that priority undergirded with prayer. So we need to pray for the opportunity before us. And then the next thing Paul talks about was pray for the word to get into the ears of the world and pray that the word then gets into the hearts of people. James talked about it in this phrase, be doers of the word, not hearers only. It's got to go in and then it's got to get into our system and then it's got to be in our action revealing our faith. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. You see, the word can get into a, a, a head, but it needs to come out in the life. We can reach a person's ears without reaching their heart. And I think we have in that one week of BBS, and we have in every Wednesday a chance for the word to get into your head, and, and we hope in 18 inches it'll get to your heart. And you'll be motivated when you leave to begin anew this week, this day, to follow Christ. And so the church must be asking the God who created the universe to use his power to take this 30 plus minutes of preaching and make it go from the head to the heart. And so then I want you to see also we should pray for the deliverance from opposition. Verse 2 says, and pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil people, for not everyone has faith. Have you ever found that in the world? Yes. You might share your faith in people. Well, I don't believe that. That's me. That's legend. That's stupid. There are some who even fight back against the church. And indeed, pray for God to protect us as we obey. Look at verse 3. But the Lord is faithful. If you get that opposition, I always remember this. David had to remember this when he was facing Goliath. Elijah had to remember this when he was facing the prophets of Baal. We have confidence in the Lord that he is faithful. And he will strengthen you and protect you from the evil one. Verse 4, we have confidence in the Lord that you are doing and will continue to do what we have commanded you, what we've taught you. I believe God will guide you into that obedience. Let's never forget that what prayer is, is talking to God. We're talking to the God who created the heavens and the earth. He spoke and bang, things happened. That's the God we're talking to. And then he also say pray. Didn't Jesus teach us deliver us from evil in the Lord's prayer? There are some unbelievers who will try to create opposition for believers. That happened in Thessalonica. Remember he preached and then there were some Jewish people that didn't embrace the, the message about Jesus. They pushed him out of town. He went down to Berea. He preached Jesus. Those people in Thessalonica went down to Berea and pushed him out of that town. There are wicked, evil people who don't want the message of Christ, the church of a loving God, to be in their community, in their mind, in their heart. And so there is opposition in the world. We need to be ready for it. And missionaries who go from town to town probably experience that more than others. Let me just tell you a recent experience. Our church supports uh, Jesse and Carrie Pryor, who are missionaries to Papua New Guinea. If you ever get a out, the U.S. is here. Papua New Guinea is on the other side of the world. It's about 18,000 miles, I think. And that's where they serve. They, they serve down a river. You have to fly into the biggest town and get in a wooden canoe. You go down the river into the bush 
and you work with, work with the primitive people there. And Jesse is a second generation missionary. Carrie, his wife, my niece, goes there. They have a daughter, uh, Nale, who is uh, in college. She is getting married this summer. And uh, then they have a son, uh, Elijah, and he is at college. He's a third generation student. Technically, he's a fourth, ge third generation missionary. He wants to go back to Papua New Guinea. But he's a fourth generation student from my dad to him who went to Johnson Bible College. And on the other side, his, his maternal or father's side, his great grandpa was the academic dean at Johnson University. He's got some great roots. And so they're preparing for their life, but they have two children yet at home. Uh, one of them is pictured right here. The youngest is Israel, and Israel is five years old, and they have adopted uh, this young man from the community where they work. Well, they have come back to America the last two years, furlough, and now the wedding. And every time they fly from the other side of the globe to, they go to country after country after country before they end up in the U.S. And every time with little Israel, they get stopped by customs because he's not a U.S. citizen and he's, uh, he's fully adopted. But they just interrogate them, stop them, go through all kinds of hoops, and they would like that problem to cease. Just because he's not the same skin color as my niece and son-in-law, or niece but nephew-in-law, I, I just, they get stopped. They want that opposition. And so in this trip to America, they've been working on the paperwork to get him to be a citizen of America so that he when we stop, they won't be stopped. The hassle will end. They just like to do their job. And so they came in the last 10 days, two weeks, uh, to get ready for this month's wedding. And uh, I was over at the house, my older sister, and we were sitting in the living room, and uh, they told me this. We'll go into the State Department in Indianapolis. We hope he'll get his stamp of approval to be a citizen of America. But the, the people have said, you, the paperwork hasn't really come in. And we gave you an email. You've got to bring the email. And the and Carrie, my niece said, we've never seen an email that they say we have to have to get in. And so they contacted the senators. And the Senator Young has helped them. And they went on that day with no email. But wanting this hassle in, and, and they went to the representative. Well, well in that conversation at the home, uh, Jesse said to Carrie, I just want to remind you, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to cry in front of those state officials. <laughs> Let's see if that will cause them to say yes. And, and I kind of laughed at that. You have to know Jesse. He, he, he has some humor like that. And I took off my uncle hat and I put on my preacher hat and I said, well, maybe we ought to just pray about it. Maybe we ought to just pray. Don't you guys remember that story in Acts where Peter was in jail and the church prayed for Peter? And then an angel came and walked him out of the jail and led him to the house where the church was praying and Peter knocked on the door and, and when the, that church opened the door, they said, who are you? They didn't even recognize Peter. And they closed the door and said, I think it's Peter at the door. And they were surprised. And I said, remember that story? Maybe we ought to pray. And then I said, don't be surprised if God opens the door. Amen. That was the thought. And I honestly did pray. I, I'm not a deep, long prayer. I just, it's on my mind. I'll say a sentence here, a sentence there. And I'll pray. The next day, about four in the afternoon, I got a text from my sister, Tammy, and her text was this, God opened the doors of prison. Amen. Oh, amen. Welcome, Israel, 
the newest U.S. citizen. Amen. What a great thing for this family. Now, with the passport and this paperwork in hand, they can go from country to country with less hassle, less opposition, and they can do what God has called them to do, and they dedicated their life to achieve. I don't know if our prayer made a difference, but I want to believe it did. Yes. I wouldn't want her to go without the prayers. Right. And I don't want you, the church, when you're in facing opposition, to not ask the church for prayers because we want to help you with God's help. We want to ask God to open up whatever prison doors you're facing. You see, Paul knew it's hard to be obedient and do the things God says when you're facing opposition. But he said, in the midst of whatever you face, you can trust God. The Lord can be trusted to do what is needed to be done for you and through you to get his work eventually done. And I know I've got to grow in believing and then lastly, in getting back to prayer, I want you to see what he said next. He said, may the Lord direct your hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. Yes. Those are powerful terms. I'm not sure I'll handle them well, but the Lord stands ready to assist you. But you and I have to continue in prayer and work to let God use that prayer and work to achieve his purpose in the world. God's protection and provisions are available to those of us who pray. But are we praying about every little thing? I heard this story. A lady had a small house on the seashore of Ireland at the turn of the century. She was quite wealthy, but also quite frugal. The people were surprised then when she decided to be among the first to have electricity in her home. Several weeks after the installation, a meter reader appeared at the door and he asked if her electricity was working well. And she assured him it was. I'm wondering if you can explain something to me, he said. Your meter shows scarcely any usage. Are you using the power? And she said, certainly, each evening when the sun sets, I turn on my lights just long enough to light my candles in the house, then I turn the power off. <laughs> and that beta reader found out she was connected to the power, but she never flipped the switch or relied on the power. And I just wonder if that's what you and I, the church, do. We're connected to the power, but we don't flip the switch and we don't rely on God's power to work in and through us. I don't want us to make the same mistake. We've got to get back to praying. We've got to get back to believing that God loves us. We're, we're trying to lead people into the love of God. Love Him with all your heart, soul, and life. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's God's love. When you see it, we saw it at BBS. We practice it. We've got to give it to children. That's a drawing power. That's the beauty of the church. But really, it's the beauty of God. God's love who sent Jesus. That's God's love and grace. So that's what we're to draw people into. And I want you to know we've got to endure like Christ's perseverance. Hebrews said Jesus endured even to the cross, scorning its shame, but now is set at the right seat on the throne of God. You stay faithful. You persevere. You endure as you pray. And so the church is supposed to pray. Get back to work. I, I just want to ask. If you've been around church for a while, how many times have you heard a fellow Christian say, you know, things began to change when I started to pray and realized that's on me and turned it over to God. How many of you have ever heard that as a testimony? It's been in my life. I'm doing better, but I still need to pray. I, I hope there's a complete healing, but if it's not, I'll live as long as I can, serving God, praying and working. But you pray for me. How many times have you ever heard the strongest believer like Jim or Dawn 
where the apostle prayed, say, keep praying for me. Prayer is not a sign of weakness. It's a dependence on the continual need of God's love and his perseverance. We've got to keep praying, never give up, because there's always a battle after what you're presently experiencing. My headache may not be all this coming. I'm going to run trust in God. Don't think that God is a theory. Some of you know the testimony of, of uh, Don and Jim. Jim's battling pancreatic cancer. He's in a state of remission. They had a test this week, and uh, it came back good. I got a text from Don. Oh, the, the antigen is good. The numbers are stable. Uh, the CAT scan next will be for six weeks, and then uh, another thing in four months. And she said, all is good. And I wrote back in response to that, Sometimes I don't want to just say great news. I put wonderful grace of Jesus because in my head, that song, greater than all my sin, how can my tongue describe it? Where shall his praise be? And I said that, and she texted back almost immediately, you know, the best decision we ever made was to join River Valley, get baptized, and accept Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Amen. And it's with his help, they are battling this serious issue. They need the prayers of the church. They ask for the prayers. You people pour out prayers for those two. And then I want you to know that's not the last battle that comes. Some of you know after that Tuesday message, on Wednesday, Jim was diagnosed with COVID. And then on Thursday, Don was diagnosed with the same. Oh. And prayers were asked for again. And Jim is doing really well today. And and Dawn is getting better. They're watching today. Would you pray for Jim and Dawn? Their examples. That God can give you strength to handle your problem. And he'll trust and deliver you in his time. You know, every test we face may eventually be our testimony how God worked. Let's go to the last point. I've gone long. I, I uh, told more stories than I intended. But the Thessalonians need to be told this second phrase. Not only get back to praying, but get back to work. And the church has to be working people until Jesus comes again. And, and in verse 6, apparently there were some in the church who he needed to kind of pat on the back or spank on the bottom you listen to what he said. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we command you. Now, that's pretty strong. I've never commanded you all to do anything because you wouldn't listen to me. But if God's word says it, he's commanding you. In the name of the Lord Jesus, we command you, brothers and sisters, to keep away from every believer who is idle, disruptive, and does not live according to the teaching of the Holy Scripture you receive from us. Wow, that's a pretty strong challenge for the church. He's saying, if you want to stay productive, there are some people you may have to avoid. That, that's pretty strong. There is a time for Christians or the church to withdraw from a person who I believe is idle, or you know is idle or disruptive or doesn't live according to the teaching, we need to avoid that person because their self-will, not spirit, will guide them. We have to stay in the spirit of Christ. And apparently there were some believers in that church who weren't working. They were idle. They were disruptive. Oh, you guys are... Yeah, it's a good thing to get baptized. Don't take that too serious. Don't, you know, don't take this going to the other nations of the world with the gospel. Uh, yeah, Paul said that. Let's just don't worry about that. And some even quit work and were waiting on Jesus to return. And so there were some believers who weren't working. And every age has some who are like the guy who wrote this. 
All my life, I've been looking for the perfect job. My first job was working in an orange juice factory, but I got canned. Just didn't <laughs> <concentrate. laughs> After that, I tried to be a tailor, but I wasn't suited for it because it was just a so-so job. Uh. After that, I was working in a muffler factory, but that was too exhausting. Uh. I managed to get a good job working for a pool maintenance company, but the work was too draining. I attempted to be a deli worker, but any way I sliced it, it uh, I, I couldn't cut the mustard. I worked as a lumberjack, but I couldn't hack it, so they gave me the axe. Then I got a job at an exercise center. They said I wasn't fit for the job. <laughs> I became a professional fisherman, but discovered I couldn't live on my net income. Oh my. My last job was working at Starbucks, and I had to quit because it was just the same old grind every day. <laughs> and so I retired, and now I found my perfect job. Now, some of you can laugh at that, and maybe you're at the point of retirement. You're waiting for Jesus to come again. But I'm telling you to get back to work in the kingdom of God. Get back to work. Bible scholars have theory why some of those Christians were idle, disruptive, or not living their faith. And some were believing that Jesus is coming again. I'm just going to quit my work and wait. And that's not what we're to do. We are to pray for Get back to work. Be productive. Don't make an excuse because there's a skin of a reason, but there's a stuffing of the law. Lesson two, Paul says, if you're not doing the Lord's work, you're doing someone else's. Avoid the person that's doing someone else's work, not God's. Now that's pretty strong. Now look what he said, verse seven, for you yourselves know how we ought to live uh, to follow our example. We were not idle when we were with you, nor uh, did we eat anyone's food without paying for it. On the contrary, we worked day and night, laboring and toiling, so that we would not be a burden to any of you. And we did this not because we had to, we had the right for such help, but in order to ourselves be a model for you to imitate. They were hard-working apostles starting that church. And they had to have an example. They wanted to leave for others to follow. And they don't know when Jesus is coming in, but I'm going to be caught praying and working. And it's just this simple. People who are idle don't remain idle for long. They either become busy with productive things or they're busy doing destructive things. And some bad character spoils good people. And those are kind of people church has to avoid. We also have to win. Listen to this. Paul wrote to the church at Ephesus in 517, make the most of every opportunity. The church is not to be a bunch of slackers, but look what he said in verse 3. As for you, brothers and sisters, never tire of doing what's good. Someone wrote, I expect to pass this world but once. Any good, therefore, I can do, or any kindness that I can show to any fellow creature, let me do it now. Let me not defer or neglect it, for I shall not Pass this way again. Make the most of every opportunity is what Paul's saying. Paul said to the Colossian church, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus. And so until Jesus comes again, you'll be praying and you be working and you use your time wisely. The fourth lesson here that he gives is take the names of the idol, take the names of the destructive, Take the names of those who are not living according to the teaching. Now here's what we, the way we draw, here's what we do. You keep telling them Jesus is coming back and then there's a judgment. Look at verse 14. Take special note of anyone who does not obey our instruction in the letter. Do not associate, and I think he means spend a whole lot of time with them unless you are leading them back to faithfulness in Christ. Be sure they're not leading you to unfaithfulness. Do not associate with them in order that they may feel ashamed. 
but do not regard them as an enemy, but warn them as a, as you would a fellow believer. So we're not to be ugly. We are to warn. We want to encourage people to work together. Life is not a dress rehearsal. We only get one chance to do whatever we're going to do on earth. And we only have a certain amount of times till we die or Jesus comes again. Well, we've got to be ready. I don't know about you, but I feel time is pressing in on me. I want to be caught praying. I want to be caught working. And, and to that end, I've kind of had a, a yearning to go back to my childhood and revisit places that mean something to me that drew me to the Lord. And these are my siblings and I. You might be able to figure out me. And it's not the one in the front of the dress. <laughs> but we have an interest. I went back to Hartford, Kentucky about three weeks ago. I went through this city, met with a few people. I went to the owner of that house we grew up in. And I said, hey, he, he invited me to his back porch and we sat down and First thing he did was offer me a beer, and I said, well, it's not, that's fine, I can do it. Okay. And we got to talk, and I told him who I was. I'm a preacher, and I, I grew up in this house. I'm one of five kids, a preacher's kids, and I just would like to go in and see my old home. And, and if not, I'd like to get a picture on the porch. He said, uh, well, um, I don't think inside the house is good to do because I don't think my dog would let me in. I go, okay, that's all that. But he says, you can come back any time with your siblings and take a picture on the front porch. And so my siblings and I are trying to work a weekend where we can go down and back in portions of two days or one day and they get a picture like that, repose like people do. Because for me, 55 years have passed. And that was the home my parents raised me in from 3 to 10. And I went to the church there in that little town. And that's where I learned about Jesus. Amen. And, and, and that little town is mentally precious to me. Because what I got as a child is what I believe in now. And I want to pass on you to build your homes that you might share Christ for generations to come as well. It's just that simple. 55 years have passed since that picture. And it's been kind of like that in many ways. One thing special about this home, my parents put scripture all around the house for saints that would reflect Christ. And there was a little plaque. I, I don't know if we even made it in VBS or not, but there was a little plaque that was in that home on the walls there that simply said this, only one life soon will be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Amen. And that little plaque on that wall in that home has been really kind of seared in my mind. I, 55 years have passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And I'm telling you, I need you to pray for me. You need to be praying for one another. You need to be praying for this church yes. that we can spread the word about Jesus Amen. rapidly and that he be honored. And that we know there's going to be some opposition come, but we stand firm because God is faithful. And you keep working. You, you might have some people we've got to warn that are in our circle. We've got to challenge them to great prayer and faithful work because number five, work is a blessing from God who is always present. Look, verse 16. He's in the Lord. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. And the Lord be with you all. And there's our strength. The Lord is with us all. There's nothing that we've had to endure that the Lord hasn't been with you. Have you flipped on the switch? Have you relied on his power? You can do that even today. Would you stand with me right now? Thank you for your patience. We've gone on with those scriptures and I hope those illustrations challenge you here today and go from your ears to your heart that if you have not believed in Jesus, you would say, I now believe. I want to obey 
And the early church taught that you need to repent of your sin, ask for forgiveness. You need to turn from behavior that is self-willed, how you would run life, to spirit-filled, how God wants you to live your life according to his word, guided by the spirit. And then would you confess that Jesus is the Christ? Would you say, I do believe Jesus is risen from the dead. He's Lord of all, but he died on the cross. He's my Savior. I need him. Would you come even now to confess Christ and say, I believe in that Christ. And then if you never have, would you be baptized? That you might bury any past and let the blood of Christ wash your sins away. It'll give you a chance to say, I'm starting brand new. I'm born again. And maybe some of you have done that elsewhere. You just don't have a church to partner with that works together in the name of Christ to advance the gospel, but will be facing opposition. Let it not be from within. Let it be only from without. And may we work together for the cause of Christ until he comes again by prayer and faithful. Amen. Amen. That's the kind of church we offer. We're trying to be that. I hope you've experienced that. And if we're not living to the level of that, come help us live to that level. We need all of you. We need you in God's family here at River Valley, but certainly in his family. That will be welcome when Jesus comes. Again. Would you come if you need a decision to accept Christ, to be baptized, to transfer membership? Or just to come and say, I believe in Jesus. Because you think it's comfortable, easy, something you're willing to do. Would you come? Even now.
let them explain about following Jesus together. We'd love to have more in this community achieve God's mission for the church, which is to go into all the community, all the world, sharing Christ. Um, a lot of people need prayers. We've mentioned the Allens. Uh, there's others you know personally. And right now, my mind can't bring those names. That's just the way I work sometimes. Uh, would you pray for those you know? Would you be Christ's hands and feet? Uh, as I look out here, I, I do see Wayne Hicks. Wayne is a quiet fella. Doesn't want attention, but he told me today that his sister passed away recently this week. So he's hurting. She's a faithful follower of Jesus, but he doesn't have that go-to sister to talk to about the Lord and encourage him here on earth. So we're going to be your brother and support you like your sister did. And I'm sure there's a I see uh, Tony has. They keep praying for Tony. His brother passed away, and it's wrong that his brother in his 40s, 48, 48 died with health problems. Mm. We believe he's in the presence of the Lord, so there's hope. There's God's hope. But there's hurt in this world. And Tony's mother, Linda, she's got enough on her shoulders working for churches of mission. Now she has COVID as well, they say. Oh, my goodness. So pray for Linda. We need each other. We need to pray. Dwayne Liebrandt, a missionary, he'd like to get back to Thailand. Uh, he'd like to have the funds to be able to do that. He, he'd like to uh, not have any more kidney stones, too. Uh, so we need to keep praying for uh, Dwayne and Mike Ball and everybody else who's got a little thing going on that maybe in your inner circle. Now. Pray for Kiki. Kiki. She's in flight back from Paris right. as we speak right now. Pray about everything. Pray about it. I've been praying for my dad's house to sell. We've got a bidder and we accepted the bid. <laughs> <laughs> Siblings are united about the process. Oh, man. That's what I've been worried about. That might be my headache problem. Right there. Uh, a, a father dying in the aftermath of being the executor. Trying to keep siblings on the same page. Father in heaven, give us strength. Keep the opposition low. Help us to work. May we pray daily, trust in you. Use us. Uh, help us to warn the people that are idle, disruptive, not practicing faith. Uh, we're going to need your guidance on the right words. Um, but Father, lead us also to the open heart who is willing to follow you. Use us anyway this week when we leave. We have worshiped you. We now want to serve you. And it's in Jesus' powerful name I pray and all those people say. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us online this week. As always, we would love it if you would come to the building and worship with us next Sunday. But if you can't, for whatever reason, we are so blessed that you come and worship with us online. Have a wonderful and blessed week. And one way or another, we will see you next Sunday.